So me and Brian just got up and got ready, made the bed in the tent, set up. Um, I think our plan for today is to just hang out here in the tent. Um, Brian's stretching. Welcome back to Closing Arguments. The pages of Brian Laundrie's notebook that were released appear to read in two parts. The first, a letter to Gabby, and the second, a letter to the person who finds the notebook. First, let's talk about the letter addressed to Gabby. It reads in part as follows. Gabby, I wish I was right by your side. I wish I could be talking to you right now. I loved you more than anything. I cannot bear to look at our photos, to recall great times, because it is why I cannot go on. When I close my eyes, I will think of laughing on the roof of the van. I will always love you. Then on the very next page, Laundry begins writing to a new reader. If you were reading Gab's journal, looking at photos from our life together, flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. I'm so sorry to everyone this is going to affect. Gabby was the love of my life. I'm so sorry to her family because I love them. I'm so sorry to my family. This is a shock to them as well, a terrible grief. Joining me now, we have two new experts in New York City, psychotherapist and host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast. Dr. Roby Ludwig is with us and in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert witness and columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman is also with us. Carol, when we look at this and it is it's the very next page, first writing a journal, a letter to Gabby, and then to anyone else who might be reading the journal. What does that mean to you? Well, I think he knew that this would be found and that it was really to the world. You know, this is his statement to the world. Um, it was very, very contrived. And um, it's so interesting how this is coming up right now when there is uh, at where when a judge is trying to decide whether there's going to be a, a hearing, a, a jury trial, where uh, because of Gabby's parents and family suing um, Brian's family, and you know this is fitting in very well with uh, is the, the fact that it's being released right now is fitting in very conveniently with that. But um, you know he said he loves her family. Really, then why on page um, seven does he say, please do not make, well, this is for his family. Please, this is what goes with what I was saying about convenient. He says, please do not make life harder for my family. They lost a son and a daughter. And he says that in a couple of times during his note. So he's really, that's part of why he's writing this, to try to, you know, keep his family out of trouble. Let's start over. I apologize to you, Robbie Ludwig. Let's start over with the correct pronunciation of your name, and I'm so sorry for that. But tell us, as um, a psychotherapist, what if this were a client of yours, a patient of yours, that was not dead and gave you this information in the form of a journal, what, if anything, would you think of what those words say? Well, I, I think Brian is a manipulator. So this was written with the idea that there would be an audience and maybe even national attention. And I, I think what we see is how the human mind can be so complex and confusing. Because I do believe that Brian loved Gabby and that she was the love of his life. But that doesn't mean he could control his anger and his rage. This was a very dangerous man. And, you know, he had a deal with the law. So he lost control, uh, basically strangled her to death. And then he had to live with the understanding that he was dependent on somebody who he could no longer rely on, who was no longer in his life. And that left him very suicidal. So. I, I think in some ways it's really interesting to see the psyche of somebody who is a, a, a murderer and to understand the complexities that love and murder can go together with a person who uh, is impaired and impulsive and controlling. 
And Robbie, you make such a great point to think about and that he he might have loved her and and said that and really did, but yet ends up killing her. It's a it's a fascinating, you're right, the complexities of the brain. And that's why I appreciate your expertise expertise, both of you. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that he put it in writing. As a forensic psychiatrist, Carol, do are, are you surprised that he wrote a journal, that he actually took the time to write all of this out? Well, no, that's what I, what I was saying before, that I think he is a manipulator and it was contrived. He wanted, he, he, you know, he wanted the attention of the world. Um, by then he knew actually that, that he had a lot of attention, that everybody was following this case. And uh, he made hay out of it. You know, he is what I call a prince of darkness, a man who is an abuser and um, the more that the man feels as though he's losing the woman, the more uh, abusive, aggressive, dangerous he becomes. So it may well have been, and there have been skirmishes like this before. His, her friend actually talked about how she would come to her house when they had some of these incidents before. So, um, so you know, it may well have been that he went on this trip with the plan that he was going to perhaps kill her before the end. Or as they were going along, you know, he even told the police um, that she was, she was, she wanted to make, she was making this a, uh, a blog. And so uh, he didn't like that she was sharing her attention with the people who were reading the blog. So he felt like he was losing her in a way. And I think as the trip was going along, maybe that wasn't his plan at the beginning, as the trip was going along, I think he was getting angrier and angrier. There was the incident with the police, and then there was the incident in the restaurant. Remember when the the, um, the waitresses uh, heard them arguing in the restaurant? That was right before they went to this place where he ultimately killed her. And one other thing that I noticed is we know that he killed Gabby Petito. He then went home before he left home and went to the swampy preserves in Florida and wrote this journal. And so what do you think, again, Dr. Robbie Ludwig and Dr. Carol Lieberman here with me, uh, Robbie, what do you think, why would he do that? Why do you think he might have gone home? What does that say to you? Well, first of all, I don't think he intended to kill Gabby, but studies have shown that those who are abusers and engage in choking or strangulation very often during a moment of anger, either where they feel that their partner is leaving them or they have some paranoid idea, go too far. And I think Brian regressed and went back to his family one could wonder if his family somehow enabled him. They knew that he was off and uh, unhinged and, and disabled in a way. And perhaps they shared with Brian their concerns about their life after this happening. Uh, so I wonder if that's why he included uh, his parents into this letter stating, please don't blame my parents for me and what I have done. So he was trying to protect his parents. But again, it was all manipulative and no self-reflection of, um, I did this, I was out of control. I am deeply saddened by this. And now suicidal, because I can't live with the, I can't live or want to live without the person who mattered most to me. Wow. This is, it keeps unfolding and we learn more information. And again, uh, the complexities of the brain. I'm appreciative you're both going to stay with me so you can continue to help us understand. We have to take a short break, but before we do, here's a look at what is coming up in the next hour. In Knox County, Tennessee, the 90 Day Fiance star Jeffrey Paschal's motion for a new trial is denied by the judge. Now his attorneys are filing for an appeal and we have the latest. We respectfully, earnestly, strenuously ask the court to consider this again. Before. Here and here. Um, I, I'm not sure it was a 
first thing you bring in. I started just trying to get in the back of the car and his backpack was on the back. So the backpack gotcha? So there's two people that came to us and told us that they saw him hit you. There's two people saying that they saw him punch you. We're just independent witnesses by Moonflower. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Where'd you hit him? I slapped him. You, you slapped him first? And then what, just on his face? He gets cool, you shut up. How many times did you slap him? And then what his reaction was to do what? He just grabbed you? Yeah. That was Gabby Petito in Moab, Utah, Moab, rather, Utah, last year. The couple was stopped by police after several witnesses called in what they thought could be a possible domestic violence situation. The police ultimately let them go just days before Gabby Petito's life would be taken from her at the hands of her boyfriend. In the notebook that contained his confession, Brian said Gabby injured herself and that the two were stranded in the wilderness in Wyoming. Here's what he writes. She would wake in pain, start her whole painful cycle again, while furious that I was the one waking her. She wouldn't let me cross the creek, thought like me that the fire would go out in her sleep and she would freeze. I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries, only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful. Still with us, psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig and forensic psychiatrist Carol Lieberman. All right, ladies. First of all, let's talk about the fact that at the beginning of this, he does again put the responsibility on Gabby Petito. Robbie, let me start with you. What does that say, if anything, to you? Well, I think a lot of abusive partners are blamers. They project, they feel so worthless and out of control that they blame their partner for anything that goes wrong, including their own behavior. But I think what's really fascinating is to watch Gabby in action. And Gabby is going out of her way to protect Brian from getting into trouble or being taken in by the police. And that's why it's so hard to save these women who are victims. Very often, they want to protect their partner. And the violence continues to ex escalate, escalate, sorry, and become more and more dangerous. So, you know, I think we're seeing all of this, plus Brian lying, this is, the sociopathic aspect of his personality lying about why he ended her life. We know this is not true. If she's in pain, call a doctor, call 911. Mercy killing? That's just bizarre. And earlier in the show, to your point, we had someone on that was able to share with us that cell phone reception is possible there, right? And so it is possible mm -hmm. to call someone for help to wait to the next morning, et cetera, et cetera. All right, yeah. Carol, as a forensic psychiatrist, does it mean anything that there's a lack of punctuation throughout a lot of the journal? I've just noticed that and I'm curious. Well, it's written in a very sort of disjointed kind of way. There are some parts where it looked like he was stretching things out, um, and you wonder what did he, you know, what did he, what didn't he want people to say to see? What did he write that he realized afterwards he didn't want people to see? I think one of the most interesting parts is the last page, or uh, it seems like the last page. He said, "I have killed myself by this creek in the hopes that animals may tear me apart, that it may make some of her family happy." So really, you know, on the one hand, he's saying, oh, we, I loved her family. You know, we were so close and her, her siblings were like my siblings and all of that. And then at the end, he says, you know, they'll be happy to know that I killed myself and that animals tore me apart. So it seems like he knew that they, they did have some questions about him. And this is a very passive aggressive thing to say at the end. And then talk about disjointed and punctuation. Yes, there's no punctuation. But then the last part, Please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. Excuse me? He starts off this, this uh, note with, to, to Gabby. I love you. I love you. You're the love of my life. Then to the world. And then please pick up. I mean, it is so, um, I mean, it shows the, the disjointedness of his mind, certainly, at the time. But also, it just shows a really, really um, evil. I mean, I really can say evil. 
person. I think he had a very ch uh, difficult childhood. And, um, you know, even though he wrote, he was be kind to my family and so on. Um, I think, his, well, his, his childhood, his family made him who he was. And he had a lot of rage and um, a lot of darkness. Yeah, you know, the other thing I just have to comment, there's still a civil lawsuit, right? The Petitos have sued the laundry. So we're certainly going to continue to follow that here on Closing Arguments. Thank you to you both, Dr. Robbie Ludwig and Dr. Carol Lieberman, for all of your expertise. Appreciate you.